Good morning and a very warm welcome to this um, Cambridge uh, Law Faculty Recruitment Webinar. Um, I'll start by um, introducing uh, myself and uh, my uh, colleagues. So I'm Mark Elliott, I'm a Professor of Public Law here in the Faculty and the uh, Chair of the, the Faculty. Um, I'm joined by Claire Fenton Glynn, Professor of Child and Family Law and the Director of our Undergraduate Programme, Alison Young, the Sir David Williams Professor of Public Law and our Acting Director of Research, Oki Adudu, Professor of Competition Law and our Director of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion, and Amelia Leinart, recently appointed to an Assistant Professorship in the Faculty and one of our Access Officers. We're delighted that so many people have joined us um, this morning. Um, I'll start just by explaining some of the things that we hope to achieve uh, through this seminar, um, and then I'll hand over in a few minutes to uh, my colleagues. Uh, one thing to emphasise at the beginning is that we have left time um, at the end of the seminar um, for uh, questions. Um, uh, you're very welcome during uh, the talks to submit questions using the Q&A function in Zoom, uh, so please do uh, make use of that. Um, and please be reassured that uh, the questions will be um, anonymous um, and that by submitting a question, um, you wouldn't be uh, revealing your identity to uh, anybody else who is um, taking part. So our aims this morning are to explain a bit of the background to this recruitment process that we're embarking on and how it relates to our broader uh, aims as a faculty. Uh, to say something about the selection process itself and how it will work. Um, about how we support new colleagues uh, who join us uh, here in the law faculty. Um, we'll also hear about a little bit about how Cambridge works, given the unusual features of the college system. So about how the law faculty and the colleges relate to each other and how the college system affects the role of academic staff in the uh, faculty. Uh, we'll hear too about the faculty's research culture and support for research and about our commitment to equality, diversity and inclusion and to curriculum diversification. And then we'll also hear from Amelia about her experience as a recent appointee uh, before we move into a time uh, for questions. So this is the largest recruitment exercise we've undertaken as a faculty. We're advertising 12 posts in total, um, nine tenure track assistant professorships, uh, fixed term assistant professorship in family law, uh, and a professor in family law as well. In addition to that, in the spring, we'll be advertising a statutory chair uh, in international commercial litigation and or private uh, international law. Um, that's obviously a lot of posts to be advertising at one time. And so it may be useful to explain why uh, we're doing this. And the reason is that seven of the nine tenure track assistant uh, professorship posts are brand new uh, positions. Uh, so we are currently looking to grow the faculty uh, significantly. And that's part of a program of investments uh, that aims to further strengthen our large taught postgraduate program, the LLM in particular, uh, but also to strengthen teaching across all of our programs and to diversify and expand the range of research specialisms that are represented within the faculty. This links into other work that is ongoing, including in relation to curriculum diversification, which we'll hear about later from Oki. In terms of our investment in the LLM, uh, one of the aims of these new posts is to enable us to uh, launch a number of new LLM papers, including papers on race, gender and the law, private law and human rights, advanced public law, law, technology and society, and history theory of international law, uh, including perspectives on decolonization. The idea is that these new posts will strengthen our existing teaching teams, enabling these new papers to be launched. So where relevant, new appointees uh, may be asked to contribute to these uh, new papers, and in some cases certainly will be, uh, but they will also be involved in teaching across papers on our undergraduate and postgraduate degrees. 
Let me say a little bit then about the process that we're following to appoint to these posts. Um, if you had a chance to look at our website, we have a, a, a page on the website with general information about the recruitment process and then links to information about each of the different um, jobs. Um, so you may have seen that we are running uh, the, these processes as separate recruitment processes. That means that if somebody, for example, was interested in applying for more than one of the, the posts, you would apply separately uh, for each and there will be a separate uh, selection process uh, for each uh, post. So apart from the statutory chair, applications are now open. So for 11 of the 12 posts, applications are open now uh, with a closing date of the 29th of January. Um, and successful candidates would take up their new post um, either in September or the 1st of October, uh, 2023. Uh, the process that we'll be following is that we will be shortlisting uh, as soon as we can after applications close um, in February. Um, and then we will be holding interviews and presentations in March and uh, April. Um, so for the uh, assistant uh, professorships and the family law professorship, um, the format will be that in the morning, candidates will be asked to give a presentation to the faculty and then in the afternoon, there will be an interview with the uh, selection committee. For the fixed term post, uh, we don't have the separate um, presentations. We have a combined presentation um, and interview format. We've already um, agreed interview and presentation dates for these 11 posts, and the dates are in the further particulars uh, for each uh, position. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, we'll hear this morning uh, from Amelia about her own experience uh, quite recently of our uh, recruitment uh, process. Let me conclude then by just saying a little bit about how we support uh, new members um, of STEF. Um, many members of STEF may be coming to Cambridge uh, for the, uh, the first time, and we aim to help uh, new colleagues to settle in as, as quickly and as well as we possibly uh, can. So all new academic staff are appointed a mentor with whom they meet regularly. Uh, mentors are intended as an informal source of support and guidance and advice. Um, alongside that, we have a formal but supportive probation process for anybody who was appointed at assistant professor level. That probation process runs for between three and five years, um, although it is possible to apply for promotion during the probationary period and a successful application would bring uh, probation to an earlier conclusion. Um, alongside all of that, we have an annual staff review and development scheme, which enables colleagues to meet with senior academic staff in the faculty uh, to review uh, matters and to discuss uh, career planning um, issues. So we aim to support members of staff, both as they join us, but also throughout um, their time with us in the faculty. So I hope that brief overview gives you a sense of um, what we plan to do through this process and some of the aims that we have um, as part of this. Um, do please uh, use the Q&A function in Zoom as the morning um, progresses. Uh, we will try to answer as many of your questions as we can um, towards the end of this session. But I'm gonna now hand over to my colleague, Claire fenton Glynn. Uh, who is going to talk about uh, teaching and also the college system. Um, thanks for coming uh, to listen to this this morning. What I'm going to do is give you a brief explanation of <clears throat> how our teaching works and how the colleges fit with uh, the faculty, because obviously for anyone coming from outside Cambridge and Oxford, this is a pretty bizarre system and quite honestly one that, you know, they came up with 750 years ago. Not sure if you were starting today whether you'd have the same thing. But basically uh, these posts are faculty posts. Uh, the faculty we will be recruiting and therefore in your job contract, uh, the teaching that you are required to do is 40 hours of lecturing for the faculty. 
Now, the faculty puts on lectures for all law students at Cambridge. It also puts on the exams at the end of the course for all students at Cambridge. What happens uh, in between is our famous small group teaching, and this is taken care of by colleges. So colleges are the ones that organise the tutorials, the supervisions for two, three or four students. Um, and they do this for every subject that is offered. So colleges are also uh, in charge of admitting students. So students are admitted to a college or to one of the 29 colleges that admit undergraduate students. There are a further two uh, that only admit postgrad. Um, and uh, then they are also in charge of things like accommodation, pastoral care. It's where students will spend most of their life. What that means uh, for you is that while you're not obliged to join a college, um, it's very much recommended and uh, most members of the law faculty are, are at college. And this is because there are really significant advantages for you for being at a college. Uh, for one thing, it gives you a room. So I'm right now sitting in my office at college. I have an office here. I have my teaching rooms here, whereas the faculty doesn't have uh, room for offices for all but uh, the, the head of department and a couple of uh, other key people. It also gives meal allowances. So most people will be able to eat uh, for free at colleges or for discounted prices. It also gives extra research allowance, uh, which can make a big difference. There's also the issue of pay. So as I said, your Work contract would be with the faculty that you lecture a certain number of hours. This does not include any requirement that you do supervise. And for the supervisions that you do, you would be paid extra by your college. And this is one reason why uh, it might look, for example, in comparison to Oxford, that our salaries are a bit low. Uh, and this is because at a faculty level, that's not the whole salary. So uh, some colleges work through a system of giving you a lump sum for doing a certain amount of things. Some colleges give you, like mine, pay you by the hour that you do extra teaching. And this adds a significant amount to your paycheck at the end of uh, every month, every term. Um, so it's important that, that you remember that when thinking about uh, the uh, financial uh, aspects of this job. So in many ways, colleges and faculty are symbiotic, that the faculty needs the colleges to organise the small group teaching and the colleges need the faculty because that's where they send all their students on to the lectures. So how to choose a college? Col this is a very much a personal thing and different colleges will have different advantages. Some colleges have accommodation they can offer uh, at a discount to fellows um, that there might be a certain number of years they're able to give you and your family a house or, some, uh, or similar accommodation. Colleges. Uh, so you might want a college that is very big, that is very small, that has a large law community, uh, that has a small law community. Um, the way that uh, this works is that when the post is advertised, colleges will express interest in uh, whoever gets the outcome of this post. So colleges will already be looking at the posts that we've been advertised and uh, bidding for a place there. When we appoint someone, they will then be given a list of five colleges who are deemed in the most need of an extra person in this area. And this means uh, that you would have a choice of one of those five colleges. So this me is done to ensure that it's not just the richest colleges that outbid everyone every time, but also to ensure that our resources are spread across the university and uh, that all colleges get uh, the help and support they need from the university officers who are appointed. I should also note that there are, um, at most colleges as well, there are college appointed uh, lawyers as well who will work with you uh, and with the other faculty appointed lawyers um, so you will be coming in as part of a team. 
I think that that's a very brief overview of a very complex system. Um, but the, the main points I want to make clear is that you've got this extra commitment to do ex, uh, supervising that comes through colleges that brings in extra money um, but it's also another home for you another intellectual home another teaching home um, and a place where uh, you get a lot of uh, cross fertilization of ideas sitting around a high table at lunch is where I just I working in child and family law I sit next to the sociologist who's working on adoption in Switzerland who now wants me to join her project I see sit next to the child psychologist whose ideas then uh, feed into mine. So it's one of the reasons that they've hypothesised that Cambridge and Oxford stay at the elite level with places like Harvard and Yale that have so much more money than us. One of these reasons is they think that the cross fertilization of ideas and the way that we collaborate at high table actually gives us that advantage. So I'll pass you back to Mark, but I would be a uh, happy to answer any questions if you have any in the chat. Thank you very much, Claire. And I can see that, that there are already quite a few questions that have, that have come through about that. Um, I think probably we'll, we'll I'm, I'm making a note of all the questions and we'll try to get through as many as we can, but I think that we'll, we'll hold those until the end and move on to our next talk. But we will certainly come back to uh, some of the questions that have been asked um, about the colleges um, in particular. Um, so next, I'm going to hand over to um, Alison Young, who is going to talk about uh, research related matters. Thank you, Mark. Um, so what I want to do is just give make sort of three short points about how research works in Cambridge, focusing first on how we support a research culture, then thinking more generally about the kind of support that is on offer for those uh, who wish to undertake larger research projects, as well as general support for research. And then finally, adding to some of Claire's points about how colleges can also play a role in supporting both research culture and in providing specific support. So in terms of research culture, uh, Cambridge is very much uh, research orientated and has um, research led teaching as well. So you find research filters into everything that we do. It's not just an element of I'm doing some teaching and now I'm doing some research, but we're very much focusing on research led teaching as well. So that can filter into what we present in lectures, particularly in the supervision small group teaching, and also particularly for these newer posts in what we do in the LLM, which is often cutting edge seminars that will draw on the research interests of particular individuals presenting those particular seminars. But more specifically, we also have research culture through the different research centres that have been set up across um, the law faculty. So, for example, I'm connected into the Centre for Public Law, and this gives me access not only to a supportive culture of others in the group, but also they regularly organise um, discussion groups, giving everybody an opportunity to present on work in progress. So you can share your ideas, get feedback, listen to the ideas of others working in similar areas, and just help to develop a research culture. Um, that way, you can also hear from postgraduates working in those areas and get to know them and make connections across the different areas in the particular centres. Also, the research centres will organise outside speakers coming in, giving you a good opportunity to listen to people people um, researching in similar areas in other universities and again giving you a chance and opportunity to meet and gather together and learn and also we're um, starting a scheme of organizing more broader seminars for the faculty as a whole giving us all an opportunity to present research on a regular basis across the faculty again so we all get to understand what people are working on be able to give um, um, different um, aspects of um, how you can understand these particular research um, interests and also just learn from one another across. So this tends to be how we generally give um, um, developing a research culture and that can also be supported through the mentoring schemes so you can discuss your research more generally. In terms of support, uh, the university gives uh, very generous support through, in particular, the York Fund. And this allows you to apply for general understanding of how research works in terms of uh, 
your support for conference attendance, if you want books, computer crisp uh, equipment, and also research assistance. So this is a general fund that is open to everybody. It's very easy to apply. We've got very detailed information internally about how that works. And so that allows you to, to have general specific support uh, for your research. We also have regular sabbatical leave. So for every six terms uh, you work, there is one term of sabbatical leave that again allows you to accrue this and have those longer periods of time to help you write longer projects. In terms of larger research grants, we have a team here that will help um, advertise these grants that are available, give you um, support and give you um, assistance to apply for these grants, particularly when it comes to the aspect of thinking through uh, what we want in terms of um, making sure you put the right money down and got the right funding and all the finance side and the mathematical side that I, for one, I'm not particularly great at. So it's great to have great support for people to be able to cost things for you and make sure you have really good and accurate research um, applications for larger grants, both support from the law faculty and also from the university more generally and their particular processes for helping you apply and succeed in getting larger grants. So that's mostly how it works with regard to the university in terms of supporting a research culture and also in terms of supporting your specific leave. Finally, in terms of college, as Claire was mentioning, a lot of the research culture can also come through colleges and it can give you a fantastic um, element of learning, not just from people in law, but also people working in related subjects. So I'm very lucky in my college that we have a formal civil servant as a warden, so I can often discuss those kinds of issues. But also we've got various people working in politics that I can talk about as well. So it gives you a good kind of element and you often learn things sometimes unexpectedly that can really help bolster your research and help you think of things more creatively. So it's a fantastic element of research culture. Also, depending on the colleges, um, you also have aspects of research, specific research support again. So again, this can be financial in terms of trying to help you apply for particular grants, but also having college related grants or college related uh, facilities that you can use if you want to try and organize a conference. And finally, they can all come together because some the research centers can also link into colleges and can also work together to put in for larger grants from the York Fund for broader projects that will support across college and faculty and your particular research area. So we try our best to make sure it's a very supportive, research orientated environment in which we give actual specific financial support, but also more generally provide a really good research culture that really helps you make those connections, learn from one another, and also learn from other people perhaps you might not expect to learn something from in terms of your research. And that can really help you explore really new and interesting avenues of support for research. So hopefully that's um, given you a brief overview of how we try and work in terms of research. And I'll hand you back to Mark now, who can then link into other aspects of the recruitment process. That's great. Thank you uh, very much, Alison. Um, we're going to move on now to hear uh, from um, Oki Adudu, who, as I mentioned earlier, is our Director of um, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. Um, so, Oki, over to you. Good morning. Um, as Mark said, I'm a Professor of Competition Law and uh, Director of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. Um, I came to Cambridge in 2006 and joined Emmanuel College at that time. I have uh, two children, a daughter and a son, 11 and seven and a half. Um, I wanted to take a few moments to hi highlight um, what the faculty is doing, um, but more importantly, how the faculty is going about making um, it a place open to all, regardless of the life circumstances. Um, I'm going to begin at the end of 2019, and at this time, the faculty had completed a review of gender representation as part of its application for an Athena Swan Bronze Award. We found the Athena Swan process to be valuable. And so the Athena Swan Committee was formalized into the, what is now the EDI Committee, which was initially chaired by Professor Nicola Papfield, on which I now chair. 
the EDR committee has as its remit to think about how we can improve the faculty as a place of teaching and learning. It has representatives from faculty members, staff and students and also works with our alumni community. I think the makeup of the EDI committee highlights how we aim to work. Um, I would say that we are learning from others and that it's important that we have a culture of looking around um, at what others have done to make their institutions good. And that might be others in Cambridge, um, but it's also beyond Cambridge. So we are aiming to be the best. And if we're not, we aim to learn from the best. I think the makeup of the committee also represents how the faculty is inclusive and aiming to be inclusive. Um, I think it's important to highlight that we're a self-governing institution. Um, perhaps Pro Professor Elliott will say um, more about our governance structure, but I would emphasize that we govern ourselves and it's important that um, within the faculty, in individuals have um, agency and uh, a high degree of autonomy. So um, I want to draw out a few examples of what we've done to improve the faculty as a place of teaching and learning. Um, for the faculty and uh, staff side, we've thought about workload and career progression, and we've thought about um, flexible working. One of the things that has happened uh, as a result of the pandemic is we've made a huge investment in technology and that does enable a lot of remote participation. And we're thinking about how we can best use or best make use of these technologies um, to enable people to participate um, in a lot of the faculty business and governance in the most effective way and the most flexible way that fits within the lifestyle and working patterns. Um, I want to say we found the framework um, established to think about gender to be uh, a useful framework and that has been adapted to think about other aspects um, and other barriers um, that people might have um, in coming and participating fully in the research, teaching and learning environment. Um, at the end of uh, summer in 2021, the faculty established a working group to explore um, ways in which the faculty might nurture intellectual uh, diversity. And that built on work of previous committees um, uh, that did work on um, how both the graduate program, the LLM, and the undergraduate program, the Tripos, uh, have been taught. And so it was thinking about ways in which the current curriculum might limit um, access to uh, the faculty and limit engagement um, of and achievements by um, all our students um, at all levels of study. Um, in many ways, it also wanted to increase recognition and debate about the impact of colonialism, imperialism and racism in uh, shaping the law um, and to think about law as a tool for action. Um, it, particularly, we wanted to think about challenging Eurocentrism in the teaching um, and uh, um, practice of law. And much of the work um, in uh, development, developing this uh, recruitment agenda have been uh, informed by um, this um, report on curriculum diversification. So I hope that this um, brief uh, overview uh, gives a sense of how we aim to be open, uh, open to new ideas and new thinking and shows some of the tangible benefits um, that we've been able to achieve uh, to date. And with that, I'll hand you back to Mark, but I'm open to receiving uh, many questions.
Uh, thanks, Oki. And we, yeah, we do have some questions already um, around some of those points, um, and we will come back to some of those shortly. Um, but before we move on to uh, to Q and A, um, I'm going to invite um, Amelia uh, to speak. So as I mentioned earlier, um, Amelia has fairly recently been through um, our recruitment um, process, and we thought it would be good uh, to ask somebody with that personal recent experience to uh, say a bit about that this morning, as well as about uh, starting in the faculty as an assistant uh, professor. So, Amelia, uh, many thanks, and over to you. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, it is a real pleasure to be here. Um, as Mark mentioned, I'm a relatively new member of the faculty. I joined the faculty in October 2021. So this is now my second year as a lecturer at Cambridge. And I would like to give a, perhaps a more personal um, view of my experience in both uh, the recruitment process and also the start uh, of my assistant professorship at Cambridge. And of course, each situation is different. Um, in uh, Some circumstances have changed since uh, last year, but I hope that some of these insights will nevertheless be of some interest um, to you. Now, first in terms of recruitment process itself, um, uh, I applied for an EU law job. Um, the announcement came um, at the time when I was doing a, a postdoctoral research here at Cambridge. And I believe, like some of you are today, I, I was um, debating uh, internally for around a week or so whether to apply or not. Um, this is a usual dilemma because um, uh, applications take time and effort. And I had already applied for several posts in Cambridge for several fixed term lectureships before that. I was not shortlisted. Um, so, so there was this question, of course, but eventually I decided to give it a try. Um, and so I prepared my application dossier. Um, in terms of the application itself, um, there was nothing particularly unusual about um, the process. I had bits and pieces already prepared for the earlier applications that I had. So I had some basis to work on. Um, I wouldn't say that that took some enormous amounts of time. Um, uh, then I, of course, received the invitation um, uh, to, to, to make a presentation. I was shortlisted. And I think that's where um, altogether this was very new experience for me. Um, I had never given such a presentation, and I have never even seen anyone uh, uh, deliver such a presentation in the past. And just to mention one detail, uh, in, in my case, it was a little bit different than what I believe will be um, uh, the process this year, uh, as I had both the interview and the presentation online. Um, now, initially, I thought, uh, because I didn't know how such presentations look like, I, I thought of seeking around um, to contact those who have already gone through this process. But eventually, um, I thought that perhaps it will be best for me not to investigate too much. I, I think it depends on everyone's personality. Everyone um, is uh, unique. And I think for me, it was just easier to sort of do it my way and 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 not to in, in to, to think about too much what works what doesn't and so forth but in terms of um um some insights I, perhaps two points i would like to share uh, and the first one and this is something that in fact someone did give me an advice and i i sort of followed it um that it it seems to me that it was easier for me to really talk about something that i was working on at the time or recently worked on. Um, so instead of coming up with some sort of strategic topic that, is, that I haven't been um, working on, um, I, I just decided that the best thing will be to talk about something that in my case, it was just um, related to my doctoral studies, because then sort of the terminology is close um, to me, the, um, the concepts are close to me. So it is it, it ju just easier to do it that way. Um, and the second point was uh, this was perhaps the most challenging part of the whole process, I, I think, um, to me personally, was that I tried to both show my expertise in the topic during the presentation. Um, and in, 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 in some ways, it was a niche um, expertise, uh, even some technical content, but at the same time to present those, um, those, those complex in a way that a non-expert would be able to understand and 
um, uh, follow. So I think um, uh, I thought for for a while actually uh, I took a, a long uh, a, a lot of time to think um, how to deliver the the deep and rather complex ideas, but uh, to communicate them in a way that would be not so complex and would be understandable. Um, and then I had an interview, um, which surprisingly was not an intimidating process. Um, it seemed to me that my interviewers were not there to make my life harder in any way. So um, uh, it wasn't something that that uh, I found particularly difficult. So I guess for me personally, um, the part of the process which required most time and effort uh, was thinking about how to communicate um, my expertise and my thoughts and, and, and that is all. But overall, the process was positive. Um, I think, I honestly believe that if I didn't get the job, I would have nevertheless felt that I gained more from this experience than I've lost. And I I, I didn't feel in any way um, sort of um, that it that it was something troublesome. I think it, it it was a very interesting process. Now moving on to my experience of starting um, my assistant professorship, I would like to talk a little bit about three aspects: that's teaching, um, research, and um, the involvement with the faculty more generally. I think. Now, in terms of teaching, I was contacted by a faculty's academic secretary, uh, I believe very soon after I got the offer um, to discuss in which courses I will be teaching. So I knew very early on what uh, I would be involved in, in terms of teaching. And what really surprised me um, in terms of teaching uh, was that I was given a lot, and I mean really a lot uh, of discretion in terms of the content uh, of, of my lectures and what I would be teaching on. It seems to me that there is less maneuvering um, with respect to undergraduate um, courses, but in terms of the LLM uh, papers, um, there was a lot of freedom to develop my research interests. Um, and I don't know if this is unique to the EU law team, uh, but I, I'm hoping that this is um, uh, throughout the faculty, but I was not told by any of the um, EU LLM um, paper convener of what I will be teaching. I was asked what I will want to teach, and then that sort of interest was fitted into the syllabus uh, accommodated through that. So this was this was surprising to me. And even furthermore, um, not only was I allowed to develop my own teaching agenda or interest within the structure that existed of the of the courses, which existed for years, uh, my EU law colleagues and even very senior law colleagues um, uh, are where and are putting additional efforts to reorganize the existing papers um, in order to accommodate for my teaching interest and for me to be able to develop um, a paper. So um, I think this openness and in a way a lack of hierarchy was something that really um, surprised me in, in this process. Um, and in terms uh, of research, I, I, I feel the same freedom. I'm not told what I have to research on in any way. Um, during my probation meeting, I was actually reassured that uh, this is up to me. Um, and I, I find that freedom also very valuable. Um, there is support. Alison already talked about um, different types of sources. I'll just add that, you know, <laughs> A detail, but I, you know, I got a, a very, very, very new, uh, nice Mac uh, right after I got the job, and, and I didn't have to go through any bureaucracy to to do that. So that that was very nice. And um, and in terms of the involvement in the faculty, in a more general sense, there is somewhat a contrast between my first year and the second year. I feel like the faculty is protective of the of the new uh, members, uh, those who joined for the first year. Um, I wasn't asked to do really anything that would be time consuming. Um, I was sitting uh, on a committee where I probably didn't contribute anything, but I was just receiving the benefit of learning about the faculty. Um, but in the second year, and again, this came as a surprise to me, um, I was trusted with roles that are not in any way um, small. They are, in fact, quite significant. Um, uh, I was appointed a co-director uh, for the Center of European Legal Studies and also an access officer, which, which is also a significant job at the faculty. And I do not have time, of course, to go into the details of these roles. But just to say one point that I think is extremely important. Um, so both of these jobs that I have, um, the, the, the roles are shared with another colleague. Um, 
And in my case, I was paired with colleagues who have already done these jobs previously and have a lot of um, uh, experience in that. So that is a huge, huge help uh, because even though um, I was in Cambridge for a while, um, the university is a big and complex machine and you have to understand um, how it works. Um, so these colleagues are able to transfer you this uh, institutional memory um, that helps a lot. Um, and one of uh, my colleagues, you've already met him, Oke, um, uh, He's uh, in my faculty appointed mentor as well. Mark mentioned, uh, I believe, the, the, the mentoring program. And I think that's uh, another very, very important um, part of support for, for new members because you always have this um, person that you can go to and, and really um, rely on. So uh, that's, I guess, all that I would like to say, um, but happy to, to, to answer any questions. Thank you, Amelia. So that, that brings us to the end of our um, presentations. Um, we're aiming to finish uh, this uh, webinar by noon uh, UK time. So that gives us um, around 45 minutes to try to answer at least some of the questions uh, that have been submitted. And we've had some really good questions. We've had around 80 um, so far. Um, I will uh, keep trying to uh, monitor the Q&A box um, as we uh, chat. Um, so do feel free to keep um, submitting questions. Um, I will try to just answer a, a couple of sort of quite practical questions that people have asked um, first, and then I will uh, see how keen different colleagues look uh, to field some of the, the other questions that have uh, have come in. Um, so a few people have asked about the process and about um, whether it's possible or advisable to apply for more than one position, um, particularly if somebody's um, sort of research um, or teaching um, expertise, uh, you know, straddles more than one of the areas that are represented. And so the answer is, is, is yes, it's absolutely fine to apply uh, for, for more than one um, position. Um, we uh, we expect that that some people uh, will want to to do this. Um, each process will be run um, in parallel, um, and so it wouldn't, for example, disadvantage um, anyone uh, if they uh, if they chose to uh, to, to do this. Um, another question that's been raised by a couple of people is uh, whether or not we would be open to appointing somebody who didn't have a phd um, in law um, so we, we say in the further particulars that we would normally expect somebody to have uh, a phd or an equivalent um, research degree um, but but the word normally there is is, is there for a reason um, and that means that we would in appropriate circumstances be willing to consider appointing somebody who did not have um, a PhD. Um, we also say in the further particulars that if somebody doesn't have a PhD, uh, we would want to be reassured uh, that, that there were other ways in which they could demonstrate that they had um, the, the sort of research um, uh, record and uh, potential that we would be looking for in relation to uh, any of these uh, posts. Um, and then a couple of people have asked about um, whether foreign nationals and non-UK nationals can apply for these posts, uh, given the, the need for sort of uh, visas and work permits and so on, uh, to which the answer is absolutely yes. Um, significant number of, of people uh, in the faculty are not um, UK uh, nationals. Um, and, and and we absolutely welcome applications from people um, from uh, other uh, other countries. Claire, was that a hand? No, that was just saying me. Ah, right. Yes, I was thinking of you when I when I was saying this. Um, um, and, and 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 I think probably that applies to um, to more than one of us on this on this call. Um, so so yeah, no, we we're absolutely um, open to appointing people from uh, from any um, any nationality. Um, and the university does have um, a process to support um, appointees uh, through uh, the process of, of seeking um, a, a work permit, etc. 
Um, okay, let me move on to some other questions uh, then. Um, and um, I'm, I'm, I've sort of divided these up by theme and I'll, I'll move around the themes so that I'm not picking on uh, the same colleague um, for too long. Um, but we, we had a few questions, um, Oki, with an EDI um, aspect uh, to them. Um, one of which is about how does the faculty support those with young children bearing in mind the real impact that this can have on things like work-life balance um, and uh, career progression. I wondered if you wanted to just comment on that briefly. Would you like me to come in on that first? Just sorry, um, as someone who has two very young children right now, so I have a four-year-old and a 15-month-old child, the college, the, <coughs> excuse me, the college has university has three nurseries uh, which staff are given priority places at this means you can uh get your nursery places uh tax free so it's done pre the uh, payment is done pre-tax which saves you obviously quite a bit if you're on the higher tax bands so this is certainly a reason why you might choose some colleges so certain colleges have their own nurseries as well or are in the process of building them so in terms of finding places for your children there's that advantage there's also the support that the university gives you and the faculty gives you so I have found that and this is obviously personal anecdote but I found the fa faculty incredibly supportive with everything child related the number of uh meetings that my youngest Teddy has turned up to um because I haven't had, you know, when he's been homesick, he just comes to a meeting and there isn't an email in advance. There doesn't have to be an apology. It's just accepted that this is part of the faculty and we have the flexibility. Or pe some people might not be able to come to a meeting because of childcare, and that is also accepted. So it's a faculty that respects that, you know, you have a life and there has to be a balance and Things can't be perfect all the time. So it's very accommodating. And in terms of, I know there are other people who've been concerned with probation um, or promotion, you know, if they know that you're going to be a woman who give, are going to have child, are they going to care? Well, my promotion got approved while I was on maternity leave. And so I can't say much more than that in terms of supporting people, no matter whether they're on leave, whether they're planning on having a family or not. Um, the faculty is one from a personal experience I can say has been absolutely fantastic. Sorry, I'll pass it over to you, Oki. I just thought I'd come in with young children. The only thing I was actually going to say was whether uh, you or Amelia would like to comment, given that you have younger children than, than my own. I, I would say that um, I came to Cambridge not having children and um, my daughter's now made it to 11. So it must be possible to have them and function. Um, oh, yeah, my son's seven and a half. Um, and so uh, um, it, it, it has been possible. I would add that um, um, the faculty have made a lot of investment in technology, um, which has enabled hybrid meetings to occur. Um, and that's been um, really appreciated both by colleagues and myself when I've had to use those facilities. And so when you had caring responsibilities and things that came up at l the last moment, you weren't excluded from discussions, um, etc. And I think that's been really important. Perhaps Amelia would just like to add something as well. I think Claire um, mentioned everything. Um, both of our kids go to to the same university nursery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks everyone for those for those comments. Um, just still on 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 the EDI um, area, um, we also had a question, Oki, about apart from a gender and intellectual diversity, um, what is Cambridge doing, if anything, to enhance racial and ethnic diversity, including in the um, in the faculty? I suppose um, one, one of the real questions, of course, we're, do, we're doing more work um, and we were open and it's really to understand um, why um, people, I suppose, didn't come to academia and if they were within academia 
why they weren't coming to Cambridge. Um, some of that is what we teach. And I think we've been opening, open in the programme of teaching and research that we're um, advertising for and offering. And perhaps you might say something about how the syllabus, both for these new posts and these existing posts, is developed because although they appear to be prescribed, I think um, uh, it'd be useful for you to say something about how the individual can contribute to the content of what goes on in Cambridge. Do you mean in terms of the content of individual uh, sort of papers that we teach? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I think that came through, didn't it, in some, something that Amelia said earlier in terms of the uh, the latitude that she had had in deciding about her, her teaching. And in fact, a question has just come through in the, the Q&A box, um, which asks about where we're, for example, launching new papers that are linked to uh, new posts. W will the appointees be involved at all in that or, or will they be presented with sort of effectively a done deal? Um, so the answer to that question is, is that for um, administrative reasons that, 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 that sit behind why we're able to advertise these new posts, we, we do have to get these new papers up and running um, in the 2023-24 academic year. And so that means that the planning pro process for these new papers is already underway. Um, but I, I hope that this is an, a, a, an illustration of the fact that we, we we do try to be as inclusive as we can, including with with junior or new colleagues. Uh, what we're going to do is that that when we hold the interviews for these posts, and where one of these new papers is relevant to the post, we will share the draft syllabus uh, with shortlisted candidates. Um, and we will then, in the interview, have a discussion about the um, proposed syllabus. Um, and the syllabus will not be finalised until we've actually made an appointment. And so while a, a good deal of the groundwork will be done pre-interview, um, we won't finalise uh, the content of these new papers um, until we actually know who will be joining the teaching team and have taken into account any comments that, that, they, that, they, might, um, that they might have. Um, and I, th I think that that does reflect something more generally about the faculty um, and, and colleagues might shake their heads and tell me that I'm wrong. Um, but I, I do think that we're pretty non-hierarchical. And I, I do think that actually uh, whether somebody is a, a professor or an assistant professor or associate professor, um, I, I think that I think that there's there's quite a lot of uh, scope to be involved in, in those kinds of things and, and to actually have your voice heard and to have a meaningful input. Um, and, and, and so we're trying to reflect that in this recruitment process and how it feeds into these new papers that we're um, going to be launching. Anybody else want to add anything on, on, that, on that sort of theme? Um, if not, a couple of uh, questions just on a sort of fairly practical level. What does tenure track mean at Cambridge? And if um, a positively evaluated, what job level does the tenure track lead to um, so this 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 has changed recently in terms of the uh, the language um, but we now make um, appointments generally at assistant professor level which is what we used to call university lecturer um, and when somebody completes um, the probationary process um, they then become an associate uh, professor uh, so completion of promotion is signified by a change to the job title from assistant to associate professor. Um, there is also a, pro a promotion um, process separate from um, probation, which allows somebody to move from what we used to call lecturer to senior lecturer, reader and professor. Again, that language has, has changed to assistant, associate professor, and then grade 11 and grade 12 uh, professors. But the, the, the basic structure is still, um, is still the same. Um, somebody also sent a, a question about references, and this actually highlighted a point that I think all of us on this call really wanted to, um, to, to, to address in this session, or it certainly hinted at an issue that we wanted to address. Um, what is expected in terms of references, and in particular, 
our Oxbridge uh, referees um, preferred. Um, so our advice to anybody in terms of choice of referees would be that you should choose those who are best able to comment on your um, academic uh, work, um, in particular research, but, but also uh, teaching if that's uh, feasible. And on the point about whether um, an Oxbridge referee is preferred, the answer is absolutely uh, not. That doesn't mean that we've got anything against Oxbridge referees, uh, but we would certainly expect the vast majority of people who are applying um, not to have a referee from Oxford or Cambridge or indeed any other particular um, university. Um, and so there is certainly no expectation that people will have uh, referees from any particular um, higher education um, institution. Um, let me move on to a couple of questions about research, um, and, and maybe Alison, you could start us off on, on this. There's a, there's a couple of questions about research funding, um, and also on uh, how uh, sabbatical uh, leave works, and, and sort of when, when it accrues and, and when it can be uh, taken. Um, thank you. So I noticed there's one question about whether new recruits get funding for their own research, to which, of course, the answer is yes, of course. Uh, the York Fund is open to absolutely everybody. It's um, So within the York Fund, there is a set amount that is um, allocated for every single um, individual. So it's not a kind of competitive process and you have to compete against absolutely everybody. Everybody has um, an amount of money that they can claim from um, within a certain time period. We try and encourage as many people as possible to use that money from the York Fund. That's what it's there for. And that's available to everybody. So as Amelia was mentioning that she got um, her nice new shiny Apple computer, uh, that is one of the things that the York Fund can, of course, be used for. It's a very simple process because there's a set amount allocated to every single individual. It means you can go away, fill in your form, explain, I've bought this for my research purposes. It's within the amount allocated to you. The money comes through and you get your computer. So it's meant to be there as to make it as easy as possible for you to have access to that money without necessarily having to compete with other people who also want to have certain access to a research pot. So we try and be as generous as possible and encourage people at all stages, including new recruits, to go away and use that funding and uh, use it to go to conferences, use research assistance, get books, get computers and do all those things that will help support your particular um, research. Um, so yes, the research um, leave allowance and sabbatical entitlement do indeed accrue during the probation period. And again, it's not a competitive process. It's not as if you have to say, um, please give me sabbatical and I'm going to compete with everybody else who also wants sabbatical at the time. You're automatically entitled to that sabbatical leave. And so the way in which it works is, of course, you have to go through the administrative process because it's up to you to decide how you want to use that leave. So some people will work for six terms and take a term off. Some people will decide to work for longer and then take two terms off or take an entire year off, depending on where they are at different processes. And we try and particularly encourage people at the early stages to use that leave as much as possible early on to get that time to work on longer projects as they're working through. So you decide as and when you want to use your sabbatical leave as it's accrued to you. So you then ask for your leave. You do explain in the form things like like what you want to be working on, not because you're competing, but because we're generally interested and because it gives us a good chance for you to think about what you're going to be using your research leave for during your sabbatical leave. And um, then um, you also have an ability to say whether this will have an impact on teaching and discuss with your colleagues about how that's going to be get done. And again, that's not a nasty, horrible thing to complete. It's just a process. So we're all aware of the fact that we thought about how we're going to accommodate this and we'll do our best to make sure everything works smoothly and you go away and take your sabbatical leave and go away and be able to do uh, larger uh, projects. Um, so I think that deals with how we get funding during the probation period, how sabbatical leave works, and also with regard to whether this can work through the probation period. 
There's also another question on research that I noticed about multidisciplinarity. Uh, we do our best to encourage this as much as possible. And we're very lucky um, within um, Cambridge because um, the law faculty is quite on uh, the Citric site, which is also close to other faculties. So, of course, we're very close to criminology. We're also very close to uh, polis. Uh, which is um, political um, uh, science and international um, studies. So, and that gives us a chance to try and interact uh, across some aspects where we might think about elements of interdisciplinarity. But we also have some research groups that are quite dedicated to that focus. So, for example, law and medicine group will work not just with regard to law, but also will link into people in um, the biomedical sciences and can draw on research there to come up with multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary uh, research uh, processes. Um, you also find sometimes in the centres that we can reach out to other groups. So again, just drawing on my own experience, there is the Bennett Institute that works on public policy. They will liaise with political sciences. They'll also liaise with the law department. And it allows for good elements of interaction and interdisciplinarity. And there's also, you might think this is quite odd, but law also links in with land economy. As land economy has law courses. And so there is aspects of individuals in the land economy department who will be working in particular on aspects of land law and environmental law. And that gives another element of interdisciplinarity because within land economy departments, there'll be economists and lawyers and uh, public policy um, and political scientists. So again, there is there are good ways of facilitating uh, multidisciplinary research. And you tend to find, as with most things in Cambridge, you will talk to somebody who introduces you to somebody and then you get to know people in other departments. And that's, so it tends to be in a very kind of friendly and informal way to try and encourage these multidisciplinary research uh, projects and processes. So I think I've de dealt with a few research questions there. Maybe I can hand back on to Mark and we can see if there's questions in other areas we want to think about. That's great. Thanks very much, Alison. Um, just one question that's come through that I just want to again um, address, um, which is a little bit like the one before about references. Somebody asks, is there a precedent for someone who doesn't hold a degree from Cambridge or Oxford being appointed to a post like this? The, the answer is is yes. Um, in, in, in fact, um, Amelia very kindly stepped in this morning because uh, the colleague who was going to, uh, to, 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 to to do this, who was appointed even more recently than Amelia, um, that, that colleague uh, di didn't have a, an Oxford or, or Cambridge um, background. And so absolutely there are people uh, in the faculty uh, who have not uh, studied or worked um, at Oxford or Cambridge. Um, and, and there is absolutely no um, expectation that somebody... Uh, would have um, applied, uh, studied or worked at Oxford or Cambridge. Um, if they have, that's absolutely fine. Uh, we think that they're both pretty good universities, uh, but there are lots of other really excellent universities out there. Um, and we certainly don't have an expectation that somebody has um, an Oxbridge um, background. Um, there's a couple of questions about people uh, who may not have a PhD in law. Um, and this may be particularly relevant to um, to some of the posts that we've advertised. Um, Claire, you were involved in a, in a discussion that we had about this very point yesterday. And I just wondered if you wanted to share what our thinking was about this. Yeah, absolutely. So if you look at the further particulars, we specifically say that your PhD should be in law or another, what's the word, is it a cognizant discipline or... A, a, a peripheral discipline. It, it's not related. necessary. Sorry? Related, I believe. Though. Related, thank you. Um, a related uh, discipline. So on that uh, ground alone, absolutely not. You do not have to have a PhD in law. Um, we would expect you to have a PhD that would be relevant to the teaching of the courses that we are talking about. So obviously... Uh, you know, one post where looking at race, gender and the law, which I've been involved with, um, it, we might, someone may not have a PhD in law, but would have a lot to contribute to such a course. What we do need to think about is how you would fit into the law faculty as a whole. And obviously you, um, to fit with 40 hours of teaching, you would need to teach on more than that one course. So what, 
I would recommend that you think about is how your experience would help you teach law students. So that's thinking about how you fit into, if it's for a specific role, how you would, you would fit with that course, but also what other courses that you could contribute to. Um, so no, it's not a barrier. Uh, yes, we would absolutely encourage people from different disciplines because we want a diversity experience. When we talk about EDI, it's not just about, you know, the people, it's perspectives as well. Um, so definitely uh, apply, but do think about how you would contribute to a position in a law faculty. Thanks very much, Claire. Does anybody else want to add to, to that point? Um, if not, somebody's asked about um, attending interviews and presentations remotely, so I can enter that fairly quickly. Um, our strong preference is to conduct the presentations and the interviews um, in person. Um, but but if there are if there's a good reason why somebody simply isn't able to attend in person. Uh, then we would um, arrange for them to present and to be um, interviewed um, remotely. We're conscious there can be all kinds of reasons why somebody may not be able to, to get to Cambridge for an interview. Um, and uh, we, we wouldn't want to miss out on seeing um, a shortlisted candidate um, for that reason. Um, there's a few questions, I think, arising, Claire, from what you were saying earlier about colleges. Um, so one question about um, what do people get paid by their colleges, um, whether they're required to take part in um, undergraduate admissions, are there college roles that may not carry teaching obligations? I just wondered if you could say a little bit about those, those points. So this very much varies from college to college. So I can tell my college, I'm at Jesus College, and we work on a model that there is absolutely no obligation that I do anything. So I could not teach small groups. I could not do admissions. I wouldn't get paid anything, but I wouldn't have to do anything. There are other colleges that work on a salary system. So, for example, you get paid uh, £8,000 a year and as part of that you have to fulfil a certain number of teaching hours, you have to do admissions interviews for a certain. So that's more a contractual model versus the more opt-in uh, model that Jesus has. So it depends on the college, but the basic assumption is you will get paid for extra things you do for the college. It just depends how they calculate that. Um, so what I would say is that it's actually my favourite part of the job. I'm an admissions tutor on the side because I love uh, admissions so much. And the small group teaching is, you know, even if you don't have a college, it would be something that you would want to take part in because it is an essential part of teaching. Um, so I was wondering, Amelia, if you wanted to say a few words, because you, Amelia, you haven't joined a college immediately. Um, do you want to say what your experience has been like? I would uh, as well mention um, <clears throat> exactly what Claire is saying. I think, of course, different people are different, but I think um, myself, I have always been part of a college. Now, at the moment, I'm not, but I'm going to join a college, that is for sure, because it is a very important part of Cambridge. And I am currently engaged in the college activities, um, uh, even without being uh, um, one. I'm engaged, I am, uh, I've done admissions because that's what Claire as well said. That's, that's a very interesting process. You, you know, you learn a lot uh, about the university. So I've done admissions. I am um, supervising students um, and, and uh, I definitely would want to continue that because um, I believe that that's, um, you know that that's that allows you to understand the students to to meet them to to really learn about the university and teaching in in as such so yeah um definitely would want to be part of that community and i am part of that community yeah and uh with people asking kind of how much undergraduate teaching we're talking about uh, at college level a an average load we say is a, up to 6 hours a week so six hours a week of those uh, small group supervisions. Um, so 
there is a standard pay rate uh, that is set by the university. Some colleges, again, top that up for their uh, for people who t- supervise for that their college, um, but generally it would be around that ballpark. Um, you wouldn't be taking much more. Mark, while I'm here, do you want me to start on some of the teaching questions? Um, well, I, I would, but just while Amelia is here, I just wonder oh, yeah. if we could also ask Amelia to comment on a question that somebody has asked about, because it links into this, I think, um, about the extent to which uh, new members of the faculty are able to undertake um, r- research um, in terms of balancing that against um, teaching commitments. And I just wondered if you could say something, Amelia, about what your experience has been over the last sort of uh, year or so. So I think that the way that I have structured in my head, it's because of the freedoms that I have talked about, the freedom to really develop my teaching agenda and then also freedom to develop my research agenda. I think that because I have a choice of that and nobody is asking me to do anything particular, uh, I am aligning what I'm teaching with my research. So I'm I am researching and then I'm teaching that as well to the students. So in that sense, I think this is the model that is probably the best because as well for the for the students, it's probably the nicest thing to, to, to have a lecturer who is um, teaching on something that he uh, or she also works on. So I think that freedom allows, because of course, if you would have to, if you would be assigned everything to teach and then your interests are somewhere else, I think that dichotomy would be complicated, but there is no such dichotomy in Cambridge. And perhaps my colleagues can 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 correct me. Maybe I was just in some specific situation, but I I I I think that is probably the thing that surprised me the most about joining the faculty and how much this the senior faculty members are asking you what you want to do. I didn't expect that necessarily. Um, as Mark said, I didn't feel that hierarchy because they would come to me and then they would say, would you like to do that? And then I would say, well, not really. I would like to do something else. And then they were like, okay, okay. So how can we make this work? So then you also research in that area. So it's it's aligned in that sense. Yeah. But I, I think as Amelia said, I think it was Amelia who said earlier that, or perhaps Alison said earlier that, that you know, our approach to teaching is very much that we, we seek to offer research-led teaching. Um, and, you know, of course, occasionally uh, colleagues do need to sort of teach a, a bit outside of, of their um, key research area because sometimes people are on leave or there are other gaps that need to be filled. But certainly for the most part, uh, we, we, we do uh, want colleagues to be teaching uh, in their research area uh, because that's core to our approach to, uh, to teaching. Um, so Claire, that, that might be a, a good point at which for you to pick up on some of the teaching uh, questions that have come in. So we've got quite a few on here, so I'll try to kind of combine them together. Um, one of the questions is whether the expectation that the new appointees would teach primarily on the new LLM paper mentioned in the further particulars. So, yes, we would expect that for those uh, appointments that do relate to a specific course, yes, we, we, we think this would be at the core of your teaching. Nevertheless, we would be wanting to think about what other courses you could contribute. And that might be, mean in the first year fitting in with other courses. Although, as I think uh, been mentioned, you do get a discount in the first year um, of uh, teaching that we don't ask you to teach the full 40 hours. Uh, we do give a, a discount where possible. Um, but it also might be thinking up and developing new papers along lines of what you are interested in. Um, because this is something that fits in exactly with what, with what Amelia says. We focus on research-led teaching, and that's why having a diversity of people coming in to teach something that they are interested in, they're researching, they're passionate about, um, is something that, that we would very much encourage. Nevertheless, we have to color, cover some core syllabus, so we'd like to know, you know, how you could fit in with that as well. Um, so student exams, uh, they're at the end of every year. Um, and we do ask uh, academics to contribute to the setting and marking of exams. We have a workload allocation committee whose job it is, 
is to look at how much each person is being asked to do across committees, across teaching, across student numbers, across marking, to make sure that the burden isn't overly falling on any one person. So you might not be marking every exam every year. Some years you might get off. Some years your colleague might be asked to write it whilst you're asked uh, the next year. So we do take the, things in turn. Um, this goes, but uh, the what is the teaching load for the statutory professor? This goes down to our hierarchy as well. Um, we don't teach in a hierarchy. You would be asked to teach the same 40 hours um, plus any college teaching and supervision um, that a junior colleague would be uh, doing. We teach in teams um, and it, it's very much, I've never had a situation where someone pulled rank or anything like that. It's always been, you know, you sit down as a group of people who are going to be teaching a course next year and say, well, this is where I have expertise in. And the other person says, well, I can fit in here. So it's all about collaborate, collaboration. Um, Amelia, there was a question directly for you that um, they've asked that we have asked for experience of delivering lectures and seminars to undergraduate and postgraduate students. And a couple of people have asked uh, what if they don't have experience of lecturing or they only have experience of seminars? Um, does that mean there's no point in applying? What was your experience before you started? So thank you very much for the question. I, I never had the experience of teaching or lecturing um, tripos type of course, which is the undergraduate course in Cambridge, which um, for, in, for example, for the European Union law is a very large um, lecture theater. Um, never had any sort of that type of experience. Um, I had a small group teaching experience in Cambridge. We have this, um, this concept of um, do, the PhDs doing the additional seminars um, in, for small groups uh, of LLM. So I had that teaching experience. Um, and I've done a, a little bit of teaching uh, as a visitor in another university, but that was also not for a large group uh, of students. So... So that's in terms of applying. I, I don't know, maybe Mark and Claire will correct me, but it didn't prevent me from applying um, to, to, to the faculty where I will need to teach for large groups. So I did not have that experience. Um, and in another point that was a little bit um, unique for me is that last year as well, um, it, it, due to COVID, uh, the, the big lectures were online. So really it's the first time that I'm actually delivering lectures in person in large theaters. and. Um, you know, you learn as you go, I guess. Um, so what that means is, no, it absolutely doesn't rule you out. Um, and this same comes to uh, people who are asking questions about uh, do you require proficiency in English law or can you skill up along the way? Um, you know, again, we are interested in people who can provide a teaching for our students. Does this mean that you have had to taught on this exact same thing in a lecture previously? No. We have lots of people from all over the world who my initial legal background was from Australia, um, you know, the, and the first time I did family law in England was teaching it. So it gives you the time uh, to learn, to skill up. You don't have to be proficient in English law before you make the application. Do we expect you to be proficient in English law by the time you're teaching it? Yes, absolutely. Um, so I hope that answers the question about open to candidates who had their legal uh, education and academic research experience elsewhere also. What you'll notice that one of the course, one of the areas we're advertising in is corporate law, uh, sorry, comparative law. And so having this outside experience uh, can, even if you're not applying for that particular post, it might be something that you're able to contribute to the faculty and understanding of a different way of thinking, a different legal system. Um, I think that covers all the teaching questions, Mark, unless you wanted me to 
go back on anything else. Yeah, that, that's, that, that's great, Claire. I can also see that there's a few research uh, questions that we haven't managed to get to uh, yet. Oh, and Alison, if you might want just to um, have a go at some, some more of those about um, doctoral supervision, um, external funding and things like that. Uh, thank, thank you, Mark. So we've had one question about, is there an expectation to supervise and support doctoral students? Uh, there isn't an expectation in the sense of unless you have supervised and supported X number of students, this will be problematic in terms of, of promotion, because obviously we recognise that your opportunities to supervise and support doctoral students is dependent on which do doctoral students apply and what subjects they want to research in. And that can be difficult to predict because obviously some topics will be more um, um, topical in some um, issues and not. It's very kind of context dependent what students wish to research in and also um, what kind of subject areas we've got expertise in to help support them. And the competitive field that we have applying for us. So there's definitely opportunities to supervise and support doctoral students. And uh, there's also opportunities to do this on a joint basis. So I spend a lot of my time supervising PhD students, but I'll do that solely, but also with a joint supervisor, particularly someone who's a more junior colleague, and we'll make sure we supervise together. So not only do you have the opportunity to supervise and support a doctoral student, but you can do that with a more experienced colleague alongside so you can um, learn from each other as you're supervising those particular areas. And I've had some really fruitful experiences of doing that with more uh, junior and newer colleagues. I learn as much from them as hopefully they learn from me. And it gives a fantastic experience of drawing on each other's expertise and giving you the opportunity to supervise, but in a way that is not sort of throwing you in at the deep end and hoping you to survive. So again, we're very collaborative and we do our best to make sure people have opportunities, but in a supported and piloted way. Um, in terms of external funding, so one question was, again, do you have to have external funding in order to be promoted and get through uh, probation? Again, no, because we recognise that opportunities for external funding are very subject dependent. So whilst there can be more opportunities for external funding in some areas, not so much in others. And also it might depend on the kind of research you're undertaking. So particularly if you're doing more socio-legal type research, or if you're doing research that's going to involve carrying out interviews, those are those areas where you need more external funding and there are more opportunities for it. But if you're somebody who um, is mostly working on legal doctrine in a library, there might be less opportunity and less sort of uh, ability to obtain that external funding. So again, we recognize that. We will support you in your external funding applications and encourage you to get the funding because we recognize that it is a particularly important aspect and area. But again, there's no set expectation of unless I've got some external funding, I will not be promoted. It's more, again, supportive of helping you get those grants. And again, there is the the ability to use those to buy out uh, teaching in certain areas. Now, there are university rules on this that are not faculty dependent. So, of course, we have to comply with the university wide rules in these particular areas. Um, there's a huge amount of support for those research grants that will buy your teaching completely. And that gives us the facility to go away and um, make sure we have complete cover. And there's also an ability to have part time buyouts. And there's complex formulas of how that works out. But there is, and again, an ability and a process through which you can buy out some of your teaching and not all of your teaching. And I won't bore you with the complex rules, but I'll just say that it is there and we do our best to try and facilitate that as and when we can. Can I just come in on that? that was, there's a uh, question that touches on this, um, asking about private consultancies. Um, and how they fit in with our research agenda. This is absolutely something that you can uh, undertake. And there is a commercialization arm um, of Cambridge University. Um, so, for example, I've I'm currently doing some work with the Irish government um, through Cambridge Enterprise. Um, I've previously worked with uh, the UK government, other private organisations to do consultancy. There are rules around this for, uh, you know, university rules and uh, how they fit with your job. But that this is a possibility. This is something that you can do. And it is something that is recognised uh, by the faculty when you do it. For example, uh, for ref outcomes, 
being involved with these external agencies can be really important. Um, so it's definitely something that can fit with your research agenda. Thanks, Claire Anderson. Um, Oki, a couple of quest- very practical questions with an EDI dimension to them. I think one, one person um, has inferred, I, I think probably not quite corrected, that there's a requirement that people live on campus, which of course isn't true. Somebody else makes the point that there is something in the further particulars pointing out that there are university rules about uh, living within a certain distance of Cambridge and, and how might this affect somebody with um, you know, a family who is settled elsewhere. I'm not quite sure what we're officially allowed to say about this, but I'm going to let you um, make that decision. Again, I, I was first, I was going to ask somebody else <laughs> um, <laughs> about it, who is uh, Alison, about location. I guess, I guess perhaps we've got a global audience um, and um, so probably should, um, although there's distance, there's also time um, in these travel arrangements. And um, I think um, the idea is that you should live close enough <laughs> to be able to frequently <laughs> come, come or be in Cambridge um, to work with your colleagues. Um, but um, I think Alison might have something to say about relocating to closer to Cambridge and bringing a family um with with them so Alison thanks okay so I I moved to uh Cambridge five years ago uh so probably terribly for the purposes of this from Oxford but I have have been at other places as well in, ca- in case you're wondering <laughs> so I didn't do my undergrad degree uh there um so um as I was moving across there's kind of um two elements to think about so um the university does have a really good scheme of helping you relocate so they put you in touch with somebody who is a you're able to talk to them about different areas around Cambridge where you can live. They'll uh, give you help um, in the kind of house hunting process. And so there are uh, people there who can help you move across, which is very useful for me to understand what the market was like and to think about how effectively to move across. Um, you also find colleges can be very supportive. So I was very lucky in that um, I was able to move across um, at a kind of stage process. So originally, I was able to come and come to Cambridge, stay in college accommodation, and then go back to be with my family, just in a transition element until I was able to fit in with my other family requirements and move us all across. So with regard to me, that was with regard to my daughter, who was in the middle of GCSE studies. So we were able to uh, Trans for me to commute and then between GCSE and A level to move the family across so we could fit in with schooling that way. And then my daughter was able to do um, A levels here um, based in Cambridge. Uh, the other element is I don't live in Cambridge. So there you go. I live in Ely, uh, which is, I think, is just within the, the uh, strict, bizarre university rules of how far away you can you can live in and live out. So it does make me uh, mostly dependent on trains. But I think you'll find um, that a lot of members of the faculty don't necessarily live in Cambridge itself. There's lots of people living in surrounding towns and cities like Ely or surrounding villages. Uh, Cambridge does have very good train links that can make uh, commuting um, efficient and effective when there aren't rail strikes or frozen rails. So I won't tell you about my journey in today, uh, but normally it's very good and very efficient and very smooth. And there are, um, particularly post-COVID, much more of an ability to think about when you come in and spend your time with colleagues and when you're able to organise your time to work at home. So there is quite a lot of flexibility um, and support for those relocating, particularly those relocating with families. Thank you, um, Alison. Uh, Amelia? Can I just add, it's not about relocating, but just about um, uh, accommodation. So we've talked about, of course, about the college uh, helping out in terms of accommodation, but the university as well um, has a huge, um, has made a huge investment uh, in having their own uh, accommodation for staff. Uh, it's, it's the area where I live as well, it's the university accommodation. Um, it's, it's, it's a huge uh, area built um, uh, very recently, very new area. And uh, it really is a university sort of community uh, with with families and people without uh, children, um, all kinds of different uh, arrangements. But that's that's just another huge um, support for university staff um, that the prices there are subsidized and there is a very um, 
con convenient um, communication, though Akia would probably disagree with that. <laughs> but anyways, um, uh, yeah, so just to add that, yeah. Thanks, that's, that's really helpful. Um, we're pretty much out of time. I'm just going to try to, to, to get through three uh, qu questions very briefly on some more practical points. A lot of people have asked about references and when do we require references. Once you go into the application system, you'll see that you, you can actually choose within a number of different options in terms of when you authorize us to contact um, referees. And so if you don't want referees to be contacted um, immediately, um, that is something that you can control depending on which of the options you choose in the um, online application system. Somebody else asks, um, would we consider applications for the assistant professor roles only from people who had recently completed a PhD? Or would we, for example, consider applications from people who are, say, senior lecturers or associate professors elsewhere? Uh, the, the answer is that we, we're open to appointing both of those uh, types of people to assistant professorships, and, and we have. Uh, Amelia is an example of somebody who was appointed to an assistant professorship quite soon after she had finished her uh, PhD. Uh, we have other colleagues who have joined the faculty at assistant professor level, um, having uh, held um, a more senior uh, role um, elsewhere. Um, in terms of the impact that has, we would, all things being equal, um, think that there might be a prospect of somebody who moves here from a more senior post, completing probation and or moving through our promotion system um, a little bit more rapidly. Um, but, but in terms of appointments, um, we, we're certainly open to appointing people at both at an earlier stage and at a more um, established stage. And then finally, Somebody has asked about uh, the teaching and the team approach to teaching and what this might mean for the new um, master's papers that we're launching. Uh, would it involve sort of just dropping a new lecturer in and telling them to get on with this? So the answer is absolutely not. Um, the process that we went through earlier this year in developing the idea for these papers was premised on the idea that we didn't want to just hire somebody and say, right, you have to get on with this now. Instead, we've got sort of ground up proposals where there's enthusiasm within the faculty uh, for teaching these new papers. And so there are already colleagues thinking about this, preparing to teach on these papers next year and that the new appointees would be joining a group of colleagues and, and certainly wouldn't simply be left to their um, own devices and told to um, put on a paper in, in, in this or that. I think from things that uh, Claire and Amelia have said, it's hopefully clear that that's not how we uh, do things um, here. Um, Claire. I was just going to add, there's one more question that I just noticed, and that's a question about suitable people applying from... Uh, who are already established elsewhere or whether these are simply uh, for new PhDs, assistant professorships. Um, we definitely have in the past appointed established people elsewhere in these kind of posts. It does, we are only advertising at assistant professor level, so you would have to take that step down uh, professionally. It will mean that it's uh, relatively easier for you to move up through probation through uh, your positions because you've already got that experience um, but it definitely doesn't rule you out and we definitely encourage you to apply yeah absolutely well that takes us a little bit over time so we will have to bring things to an end there um, we're, we're very excited as a faculty about these new posts and about the new opportunities that they bring in terms of the teaching that we can do and the research that we can do. And so we're, we're delighted to be embarking on this process and to have started it off with this, um, I hope, really helpful seminar this morning. We've had lots of really good questions. Um, we had about 150 questions. I'm not sure how many we've answered, but I, I, I hope that we've answered a, a, a good number or at least provided partial answers to um, a good number of the, the questions. So if, if you, you do still have further questions, please do. Uh, my, I'm very happy to answer any questions, of course, on a completely confidential basis. Um, so do just send me an email um, and you won't have to hear my gravelly voice. So I might actually be able to give you a bit more information. So please do feel free to reach out.
that's very kind, Claire. I think I think more generally, uh, we do give um, contact details in the further particulars, um, and our deputy faculty administrator is sort of coordinating any queries, but will send them on to to us or to uh, those involved in the different posts. So if you do have questions that haven't been answered, as Claire says, or additional questions after this morning, uh, do feel free to use the contact details um, in, in the further particulars uh, as well. So if, if you do decide to uh, apply, uh, we wish you all the very uh, best with that. We we hope to meet some of you in due course in, in the presentations and um, interviews. Uh, and it just remains for me to thank uh, my colleagues who have given up their time this morning. So thank you very much to Alison, Claire, Amelia Oki, and also a particular thanks to somebody that you can't see on the screen, but Daniel Bates, our legal IT uh, teaching and development officer, who has been behind the scenes making sure that everything has worked. Uh, so thank you to Daniel as well. So thank you for joining us and the very best uh, of luck uh, if you decide to uh, apply. And like I said, we hope to have the chance to meet some of you um, at later stages of this process. Thank you.